D&D number five, Angels in Jesus' Name, chapter six. Officer Hornsby grabbed Keegan, spun him around, and shoved his face down against the trunk of the cruiser. What is it supposed to mean? Well, if you and Elizabeth are close, why haven't you been to see her one time during the past month? Because I've been here the entire month of September, and I haven't seen anyone come to visit her. So if you believe you and Elizabeth have something going, I believe it's all in your head. The officer slammed his weight against Keegan's back. Tell me this, smart boy. Where is Lizzie now? I don't know. Officer Hornsby walked to the front seat of his car and pulled out a second pair of cuffs. He grabbed Keegan's arms and led him toward the passenger side door. And next thing Keegan knew, he was attached to the door handle. I'm going to check out the house. Keegan held his breath, hoping the jerk wouldn't go through his things. Since he returned just a minute later, he figured he was checking only for signs of Elizabeth. He thought of calling the officer's attention to the fact that it was obvious Mike Moreland occupied a bedroom inside, but he didn't want him to find his guns and badge, so he kept his mouth shut. Where is she, Moreland? I don't know. You'd better figure it out quick, because if I don't find her very soon, we're taking you in. For what? Well, that depends on what condition Lizzie's in when we find her. What are you trying to say? You think I've done something to her? Go! F Hornsby backhanded him, grabbed him by the front of his shirt and shook him. Where is she? The officer demanded. Keegan spat blood from his mouth. It was obvious the guy cared for Lizzie and was truly worried about her. He realized the idiot could actually help find her. Look. She went to visit her husband's gravesite. She was supposed to be back by now. I don't know where she is. I was just on the phone to a buddy trying to get a ride to go look for her. And you don't know anything about her vehicle being abandoned on the side of the road about three miles from here? Keegan's face paled. It is? Yeah. Her van pulled off on the side of the road. No sign of her. Hell. Keegan jerked at his cuffs. He needed help now. Get on it, Keegan said out loud, hoping John was still on the line. Hornsby grabbed him. Get on it. Who do you think you are? When Keegan didn't answer, Hornsby shook him. You know something, don't you? What did you do to Lizzie? And the girls, Keegan added for him. What? And the girls. We care about them too, right? What did you do to them? I didn't do anything to them. You need to stop worrying about me and start looking for them. Hornsby's large fist slammed into Keegan's gut. He drew back again, but Keegan had had enough. If he didn't stop Hornsby, the internal injuries could in incapacitate him. Before you go too far, too far, you might want to find out who you're roughing up. I have friends in high places. The softly uttered words gave Keegan a reprieve. Officer Hornsby stood back, his eyes traveling over the stranger, wondering if he'd made a big mistake. It was at that moment the screen door slammed and Elizabeth stepped out onto the porch. What in the world is going on? Lizzie demanded. Where have you been? Keegan growled. The van broke down. I had to walk with the girls. I came right past your van, Lizzie, Hornsby said. I didn't see you walking. You know I would have picked you up. I took the shortcut through the woods that comes out at the back of the house. Mike, what happened to your lip? Keegan eyed Hornsby. You want to tell her, or should I? Daryl Hornsby, what in the world has come over you? How dare you come onto my property and beat up my patient? Your patient? Yes, my patient. I'm acting as a private nurse while he recovers from his car accident. Ah, oh, Lizzie, why didn't you tell me? Tell you? Why should I tell you? I wasn't aware I had to inform the local police of my every move. Well, of course you don't. I just thought maybe because you and I, well, you know. Lizzie glanced at Mike. His eyebrows were raised in question. Her eyes narrowed. She came down the steps to stand between the men. No, Daryl, I don't know. Now why are you here? Mrs. Griswell called the station and said there was a suspicious man hanging around your house. Said lately there's been a car she didn't recognize driving down the street several times a day. I came to investigate and found this guy. I was getting ready to take him down to the station to question him. Mrs. Griswell is blind as a bat and an old busybody. She motioned toward Keegan. Is he under arrest for something? No. Then I suggest you unlock those cuffs and take yourself on out of here. 
Daryl removed the cuffs, and Keegan glared at him, and Hornsby glared back and then looked back and forth between Lizzie and her patient. Suddenly, the officer stepped toward her, wrapped his beefy hand around Lizzie's arm. Before I leave, I think you and me need to have a little talk. Take your hand off her. The command came quietly, but sent chills up Lizzie's spine. He, he's not hurting me, she said quickly. Nevertheless, Daryl did let go. Lizzie, don't you think you need to be careful about who you have living in your house? Well, I didn't just pick him up off the street, Daryl. Now, I'm tired. I've had a bad day. So just go on now. She looked toward Keegan. Please, come in, Mike, and let me see to your lip. You're bleeding. Daryl watched as Mike moved toward the porch, his hand moving to the small of Lizzie's back as he ushered her up the steps. You two got something going on, he blurted out. Lizzie whirled, her face colored. That is none of your business. I should have known. What is that supposed to mean? You were a tease in high school, and you still are. Lizzie gasped, and Keegan started back down the steps, but she grabbed his arm to halt his progress. Daryl Hornsby, you know good and well that Bradley and I were a couple back when we were in school, and I have never led you on in any way, not back then and not since his death. Good Lord, Daryl, you and Bradley were supposed to have been friends. What would he think of you saying something like that to me? Well, what would he think about you taking some guy in off the street like some cheap hooker and... Keegan started back down toward Hornsby. At that moment, the backup Hornsby had called for arrived. The second officer was out of his car in a second, his gun drawn. Keegan raised his hands in the air immediately. He wanted to, no mistakes that would lead to his accidental death or to Lizzie getting hurt. Hornsby turned and shook his head at the officer. It's okay, Frank. It was just a misunderstanding. Now you just leave here, Daryl, Lizzie said. She motioned to the other squad car. And take your little friend with you, she ordered. The man stood there staring at Lizzie for several moments. Okay, he finally said. But you and me, we got a lot to talk about. I have nothing more to say to you, she declared. Like I said, Hornsby, Keegan added, you're delusional. She stood there as the officers took their leave and then turned to Keegan. Mike, I am so sorry. Are you okay? Oh, I'm just hunky-dory, he said sarcastically, and you and me also have a lot to talk about. He took her by the arm and ushered her inside the house, grabbing up his cell phone as he passed it. You still there? Well, that was entertaining to say the least. I'm on your street. You need me? Nope. I'll call you later. He shoved his phone in his pocket and turned to Lizzie. Oh, yeah, we gotta talk. Okay, okay, we'll talk. But let me see your face first. You're bleeding. Damn it, Elizabeth, I'm okay. Don't you curse at me. I'm sorry. You're forgiven. Now I'll get you a wet cloth. She strode toward the kitchen. Keegan glanced at the girls who were all curled up on the sofa in the den watching TV. He wanted to have a few crosswords with their mother, but darn it, if she wasn't doing her thing where she has to take care of everyone else first. He sat at the table. Elizabeth. I hope you don't put any credence into what he says. No, of course not, she said sadly. I admit it hurt a little, but I really don't care what he thinks. He says your van is about three miles away. Yes, it is, she said, bringing the cloth to him. She tried to dab at his lip, but he grabbed the cloth from her and simply wiped his face. It just stopped. I have no idea what's wrong with it. How far was the shortcut you took? About two miles. He shook his head as he imagined her having to drag all the kids out of the van and trudge with them for two long miles through the woods. Daisy and Lily struggled. A little. I took turns carrying them. It was hard on all of them. They're exhausted. And how about their mother? She shrugged as the telltale tears came to her eyes. It's been a hard day all the way around. The van breaking down was just the perfect ending. Okay, he said softly. He sighed. Listen, I want you to tell me all about it, but first, go to your room, soak in a tub, get comfortable while I make dinner for you and the girls. Oh, no, I couldn't. Elizabeth, will you stop fighting me every time I try to do something nice for you? She didn't answer. Her eyes welled with tears and spilled over. He reached for her, but she shrugged him away. Lifting her chin, she strode out of the kitchen. New scene. 
She hadn't meant to fall asleep, but the bath water was so warm and comforting and felt too good on her aching muscles. And when she woke, the water had cooled and her fingers and toes were prunes. Rising, she rubbed her skin briskly with a thick towel, combed out her wet hair, and rubbed some lavender cream on her arms and legs. Donning a soft nylon gown and her robe, she headed for the kitchen and the disaster she expected to find. Yet, glancing around, the kitchen told her Mike had things very much in hand. The kitchen was clean, dishes drying in the drainer, and a plate of leftovers covered with plastic wrap sat on the counter. Peeking at the food, she found some sort of rice and chicken concoction, green beans and cheese bread. Not bad, she thought. She headed for the den to grab the girls and get them ready for bed, but Mike had beat her to it. They were all in their pajamas, and they were all sound asleep, lying all over the sofa and all over Mike. Lily slept on his chest. Desi was up under one arm. Daisy was up under one arm. Violet under the other. Rose's head lay on one thigh and Heather's on the other. Oh, how she wished for a camera. The floor creaked as she stepped into the room, and Mike immediately opened his eyes. Hey, she whispered. He smiled. Let's get them to bed, she said. One by one, they carried the babies to their beds and tucked them in. Heather woke briefly, but Elizabeth spoke softly to her until she drifted back to sleep. They went back into the den. Did you eat? Keegan asked. Not yet. Come on, he said, guiding her into the kitchen. He put the plate into the microwave while she sat. A minute later, he set the plate of food in front of her. What would you like to drink? Oh, I'll get, what would you like to drink, Elizabeth? He said firmly. She sighed, just water. He iced down some water and set it next to her plate. Keegan lowered himself into the chair next to her. So, sweetheart, tell me about your horrible day and then I'll tell you about mine. Sighing, she took a bite and chewed slowly. Her face registered surprise at the tasty dish. This is good. Thanks. My mother insisted on teaching me to cook some things before I went away to college. Now, tell me about your day, he repeated. I took the girls to see their father's gravesite. I take them each year. I want them to know about him. I want them to know he was a good man. I want them to appreciate him. When we got there, though, Bradley's parents were there. That's never happened before. Mrs. Anderson was visibly upset. I didn't approach the grave while they were there, but she was still very angry, and she stormed over to me and the girls and told me that she couldn't believe I would have the nerve to come there. Lizzie stopped while she got herself under control. Keegan touched her hand. You were his wife. Doesn't she realize you have as much right, even more of a right, to be there as she does? No, she doesn't think that at all. I tried to explain to her that I meant no disrespect, that I loved Bradley too, but she wouldn't listen. She yelled at me. She called me a horrible name in front of the girls and said I'd killed her son. The girls started crying, and I, I hurried them off to the van. We stayed there until the Andersons left. I tried to explain to the girls why Mrs. Anderson was so upset, but I don't think I got through. After that, the girls were frightened and didn't want to see the grave, so I took them to Mrs. Hurley's house. Then I went back. I tried to talk to Bradley. I know that sounds silly, but speaking to him there, sometimes it feels as if he can really hear me. It doesn't sound silly. I understand. She shook her head and waved her hands in the air. Anyway, the words just wouldn't come this time. Finally, I went back to the, get the girls, and I was so upset Mrs. Hurley insisted I stay and eat something. The time got away from me, still... I would have been home by four if the van hadn't broken down. It took forever to walk the two miles with five little girls. Elizabeth, why didn't you call? She looked up. Call? Yes, you know, on a phone. Her chin lifted at his sarcastic tone. How was I supposed to call? On your cell phone? I don't have a cell phone, Elizabeth, he said, forcing himself to be calm. Why don't you have a cell phone? She frowned. I can't afford one. You can't afford not to have one, not when you have five children. She stopped eating and slammed her fork down. You can't get blood from a turnip, okay? 
I just don't have the money for a cell phone right now. You have no idea what it's like to make ends meet, worried if you'll have enough to feed the children next week. There are some things I just have to do without. His heart lurched as he watched the fire in her eyes. Her silky blonde hair bounced around her shoulders as she jerked her head, emphasizing her words. Her pale skin showed spots of red on her cheeks. Okay, okay, calm down. I I'm just a little upset myself. I was terrified that something happened to you and the girls. I couldn't reach you, and I kept picturing these terrible scenes in my head. I'm sorry, Mike. I didn't mean to worry you needlessly. That's what I get, I suppose, for caring so much. Really? Yes, really. And all day, while I waited and worried, I decided this will not happen again. What do you mean? Well, first, I'm getting you a cell phone. Second, I'm buying myself a car. Third, I'm going to ask you to not go off without talking to me first. Now, just wait a minute. Look, I know that sounds pretty archaic, but I can't go through another day like I did today. If I'd known you were going off, I would have asked how I could reach you, and you would have told me you had no cell phone, and I would have given you one of mine. Elizabeth, I care about you, you and the girls, and I want to protect you. Protect me from what? He drew a deep breath and blew it out. From harm. Lizzie rose and cleared her place. Well, the only danger I was in was getting snagged on a briar or stepping in a hole. No big deal. Not wanting to argue about it, he shoved the subject aside. I bet you're sore from carrying the girls, aren't you? Sore and tired, she admitted. Come on, he said, pulling her along. You're about to get the royal treatment. He led her to her room. Take your robe off, he commanded. She obeyed willingly, untying the belt. His large hands came to her shoulders and removed the garment. Lay down on your stomach. Again, she obeyed. He leaned over her and began to slowly massage her neck and shoulders. Lizzie purred as he moved his strong hands over her, letting the tenseness and stress leave her body. Keegan moved down her arms and between her shoulder blades. I meant to tell you, I accidentally broke the television that you bought from my room. You did? How? I was exercising and I knocked it off the dresser. Don't worry, though. It, it won't cost you a thing. I've already called Jeff and he's bringing out a new one tomorrow. Jeff? Yeah, he sells electronics. He's giving me a great deal. Oh, well, good then. I hope you're not upset by me breaking the TV. No, Mike, of course not. Then why do you seem upset? Really, I'm not. I was just thinking about what it may cost me to get the van fixed. Well, I've already had it towed here. I'm going to look at it for you tomorrow. She tried to rise up and he pushed her back down. Oh, Mike, you shouldn't have. Why not? You shouldn't be spending your money on things to do with this family. Again, why not? Supporting herself on her forearm, she looked back over her shoulder. Mike, look, just because you're, well, I mean, just because, oh, I don't know how to put this. Just because we've become close doesn't mean that I have the right to help you in any way. Sort of. I mean, it doesn't mean that you're obligated to me. I don't feel obligated. I wanted to help, and I did. Well, I don't want you to help. Why not? Will you stop saying that? No. Now lie down and let me finish this. Letting out an exaggerated sigh, she settled back down, and Keegan began to work on her thighs and calves, and next he slowly rubbed each foot as she moaned and groaned her approval. Lizzie tried to rise, but he placed his other hand on her back and pressed her down. Just relax, he said. Relax with me, she invited. Sighing, he took her up on her offer and lay down beside her. Your hands are so strong, she whispered. You make a great personal masseuse. His deep chuckle against her ear made her smile. <clears throat> her eyes closed in contentment as he ran his hand up and down her arm and then brought both arms around her and squeezed her tight. She turned her face up to him and he kissed her deeply, lingering over her lips. What a beautiful man, she thought, inside and out. The times he seemed grumpy or bossy were far surpassed by the time she'd watched him playing with the girls and tending to their needs and those of their mother. If only he could be interested in her for the long run. Yet she couldn't blame him if she wanted to get back to his old life. Her brow wrinkled, though, as she realized he hadn't really mentioned leaving. 
As a matter of fact, he seemed as if he wanted to, didn't want to leave. He certainly was well enough now to take care of himself. Dare she hope it's because he had real feelings for her? Her heart began to race. He'd said he cared. Maybe it was even more than that. His actions spoke volumes. He was protective of her. He did things for her, and the girls certainly didn't seem to scare him. Is it possible? Could she be so lucky as to find someone to share her life with? Lizzie was falling in love with him. She admitted that, at least to herself. Maybe if he knew how she felt, he would open up and share his feelings. Again, then again, what if she was wrong? What if he was just a very nice man who intended nothing other than a pleasant time with her before returning to his life? If that were so, then blurting out her feelings could chase him away. And she wasn't ready for him to be gone. Not yet. What is going through that beautiful head of yours this time? He asked softly as he took her hand. I was thinking about how good it feels to be close to a man again. It's been so long, and not just any man. It feels good to be close to you. The way you make me feel, it's incredible. How do I make you feel? Like a woman, like I'm beautiful, like I'm desired. You are all those things, Elizabeth. You are incredibly beautiful. As for you being desired, I want you so much I can barely function when you're not around. And as far as you being a woman, you are a sweet, wonderful, strong woman that I have grown to admire and respect. <clears throat> Biting her lips, she reached up and touched his face. Thank you, Mike, for those kind words. I'm not being kind. I'm stating the truth. She grinned. I love it when you get all testy. I'm not being testy. Sliding off the bed, she stood in front of him. Yes, you are. She bent over and kissed his mouth. Lizzie smiled sweetly at him as she pulled away slightly, placing her hands on his thighs. He gave a soft grunt of pain. What, are you in pain, she asked, running her hand over his thigh. Just a bruise, I'm sure. A bruise from what? Let me see. He knew she wouldn't let it go, so he stood and lowered his sweats and stood there in his boxers as they both examined his thigh. A long, slender bruise covered his thigh. What happened? she asked. Uh, your cop boyfriend happened, Wiggy Keegan answered. He's not my boyfriend, and I could just kill him for doing this to you. He grinned. Oh, I think I like having you defend me. You offering to kill someone for my sake? It's kind of sexy. New scene. Startled, Lizzie shot up straight out of bed. The morning light shone through the lace curtains of her window. Glancing at the clock on her dresser, she hit the floor running. She never overslept. and Never. Heather would miss the bus, and Lizzie had no way of getting her to school. And pulling on her robe, she threw open her door and flew out into the hall. The girls' rooms were empty. The house was empty. The entire house was empty. Panic enveloped her. She dashed across the hall toward Mike's room. And that's when she heard the voices coming from the other side of the front door. Lizzie jerked the door open. Four tow-headed little girls sat on the top step of the porch, watching Mike, whose head was under the hood of her van. He looked up, smiling. Hi, sleepyhead, he said softly. Her hand settled on her chest, lamely trying to still her speeding heart. Where's Heather? Hi, Mommy, the girls called, all rising to give her morning hugs. Heather went to school on the bus. Keegan approached, wiping his greasy hands on a rag. I hope you don't mind that I got her off to school. You were so tired. You didn't even move when I tried to wake you. She frowned. I don't like her going off to school without getting to give her a hug. Was she upset about not getting to see me? Uh, she didn't seem to be. She seemed to think it was great fun surprising you about what a big girl she was, getting dressed and ready all by herself. I'm sorry, though, Elizabeth. I guess I overstepped my bounds. Sighing, she shook her head. It's okay, I guess. It just feels weird. She bent down and scooped up Daisy, who was pulling on her robe. Are you hungry? We already had breakfast, Rose answered for her. You did? We made oatmeal. Mr. Mike helped us. She looked over at him. You're just a jack-of-all-trades, aren't you? Maybe. 
Not sure if she thought that was a good thing or bad, he came forward and kissed her tenderly. The girls giggled. Good morning, he said softly. He looked down at the girls, who seemed to be all ears. I hope it's okay that we made breakfast. The kids were very helpful. Lizzie smiled. No, again, it's okay. It just seems weird, this guy cooking breakfast for a house full of females. I usually don't let the kids in the kitchen without an adult. Well... I'm not a kid. No, you're definitely not a kid. You're definitely all man. And speaking of all man, did you find out what's wrong with the van? He grinned. I believe that was a sexist remark. Cool. And to answer your question, it appears to be the timing belt. She frowned. How much is that to fix? A few hundred dollars, assuming it didn't damage the engine when it broke. Her mouth dropped open. Don't worry, I can fix it for practically nothing. What is practically nothing? Well, maybe I could talk you into making another one of those apple pies. She smiled. It's a deal. You really are a jack of all trades, huh? He shrugged. Always been good with my hands, he answered. He glanced down at his watch. Um, Jeff is coming by soon to deliver a new TV, and then we're going car shopping. I'll pick up a new belt while we're out. Will you and the girls be okay for a while? I could be gone a few hours. We'll be fine. He nodded and smiled. Here's a concept. I'll have my cell phone, and you can call me if you need me. You could even practice with the new cell phone I gave you. That is the end of chapter 6.